Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. You might have noticed it's pretty colourful this morning. A lot of people wear Hawaiian shirts and that sort of thing around the place normally, but uh, I mentioned that last week, so a few of us are doing a bit extra today. And you'll find out a little bit more about that near the end of the, or at the end of the service, for why we're doing that. But let's, uh, before we begin this morning, just an announcement, which is actually a little bit, um, a bit sombre as well, for those who don't know. Um, a former member of the congregation here, um, Max Schultz's son, Peter, passed away suddenly on Thursday. And uh, so we'll be praying for Max and the family today. And uh, just letting you all know, there will be more details provided about funeral arrangements once they come to hand. So um, when you hear that in the prayer, we didn't want you to be surprised by that, but to have heard about it beforehand. Let's begin our worship today, though, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it is a, a bright, colourful day. It is another day that God has given us, different to any other day that He's given us before. So let's sing our first two songs. And the first one is, This Is The Day.
Spirit of the living God, remind us that we are all members of the one body, and if one member suffers, we all suffer. May we, as the body of Christ, be the best evidence of your love for all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we come before God with our confession of sins and to take up his free gift of forgiveness. Dear Lord Jesus, we know that we are born with sin and that no matter how we try to help ourselves, we can't. We have turned our back on you, not done as you have asked and gone our own way. We have done wrong things against our family, friends and neighbours. We've been impatient, selfish, unkind, unforgiving and demanding. We have not loved other people the way that you have shown love to us. Lord Jesus, help us. Please show us mercy. Forgive us for the wrong things we have done and show us how we should live our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. We read in the book of Hebrews, which is where our second reading for today comes from, that Jesus entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, and that he has appeared once for all to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. So as a called and ordained servant of the word, by the command of Jesus and on his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Amen. And we'll hear our readings from God's word for today. The first reading for today is written in Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, and chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you'll be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose woman you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, who has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is written in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 to 28. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel reading. The gospel reading is written in Mark chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. 
As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Oh, I was going to test everyone to see if they could remember the Lord's Prayer from their Confirmation Days, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed from their Confirmation Days, but that's okay. We confess the faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the text for the message today is not one or the other of the texts. It is calling on both uh, two heroes of the faith. The first one from the book of Ruth and the second one is one whose name we never hear, uh, which is the, the woman in the gospel lesson. So we'll be using the Old Testament lesson and the gospel lesson for today as we look at this whole idea of, of how we judge from what's on the outside. So let's pray. Lord, make us holy in your truth, for this your word is truth and life. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to tell you a story written by a woman by the name of Rebecca Pippet. And the story is called A Guy Named Bill. His name is Bill. He has wild hair, wears a t-shirt with holes in it, jeans and no shoes. This was literally his wardrobe for his entire four years at university. Bill is brilliant, kind of esoteric, but very, very bright. He actually became a Christian while he was attending university. Across the street from the university campus is a very well-dressed, very conservative, very historical church. They want to develop a ministry to the students at the university, but are not sure how to go about it. One day, Bill decides, because of his faith, to go to worship with them there. He walks in with his no shoes, his jeans, and his holy t-shirt, and wild hair. But he didn't get the service order, the service time right, and when he walks in, the minister's already in the middle of his message. So Bill starts down the aisle looking for a seat. The church is completely packed, which lets you know it's not a Lutheran Church of Australia church. <laughs> so there's no seat along the aisle, and by now people are starting to look a bit uncomfortable because Bill keeps making his way with his bare feet further and further down the aisle looking for a seat. He gets closer and closer and closer to the pulpit. When he realises there's no seats, he just squats down and sits cross-legged on the carpet. Perfectly acceptable behaviour in a university fellowship. Maybe not so much in this old traditional church where everyone had their pew. 
By now the people are really uptight and the tension in the air is pretty thick. And still trying to preach through the distraction about this time, the minister suddenly realises that from way at the back of the church, an elder of the church is slowly making his way towards Bill, down the aisle. Now the elder is in his 80s. He has silvery grey hair, a three-piece suit and a pocket watch. Again, not a Lutheran Church of Australia church in summer anyway. A godly man, very elegant, very dignified, very courtly. He walks with a cane. And as he starts walking towards the boy, everyone in the church is saying to themselves, well, you can't blame him for what he's going to do. How can you expect a man of his age and background to understand some university kid sitting on the floor? It takes a long time for the man to reach the boy. The church is utterly silent apart from the clicking of the man's cane. All eyes are focused on him. You can't even hear anyone breathing. The pastor's just stopped. The people are thinking he can't even preach the sermon until the elder does what he has to do. And now they see him reach the section beside Bill where he's sitting on the floor and he drops his cane on the floor and it clatters on the hardwood. And then with great difficulty, he lowers himself down and sits cross-legged next to Bill and worships alongside of him so he won't be alone. Everyone chokes up with emotion and there seems not to be a dry eye in the entire church. And when the minister finally regains control and is able to preach again, he says, what I'm about to preach and what I have preached already, you will never remember. What you have just seen, you will never forget. Grace stands out in our world because judgment is so very common. We learn the lesson from our Lord Jesus not to judge by what is on the outside in one of his conversations with the Pharisees who says you look like you look pure and white on the outside but you're like someone painting a tomb. It's all decay and rotten on the inside and you only care about what the outside looks like. And the readings for today, I found, have this same theme running through them. Our first reading for today comes from my absolute favourite book of the Bible, the book of Ruth. And I can't remember who the story was about. I looked it up, but I couldn't fi find it again. I read it once. That there, and if someone knows the story and knows who this is, they can please tell me. There was a Christian um, professor at a university, a pretty well known, apart from by me, apparently, and um, he came across a group of other professors who were rubbishing the Bible as being not very good literature. They didn't believe in it. It's not very, you know, it's just, you must be crazy to believe in that stuff. There's nothing really good in there. And talking about what are some really good works of literature and what they need in them. And he said, you're right, let me read you a short story. And he read them a short story. And they said, that's amazing. That story has everything. It has intrigue and tragedy and politics and love and loyalty and courage and a happy ending. Where on earth did that come from? And he said, that's the book of Ruth from the very Bible you were just denigrating. What we see from this book, and we see it more in the first half of the book, which I think was read, the first part of the book which was read in our Old Testament reading last week. Ruth was on the outside of Jewish society. She came from the outside, from Moab back to Israel with Naomi, her mother-in-law. And you may remember that beautiful speech when Ruth's husband died and Naomi was going to go home to her own people. And she said, stay here and get remarried and that sort of thing. And Ruth made that beautiful speech. No, don't force, tell me to go away from you. Where you die, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Where you stay, I will stay. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And if you were a, per a bookmaker in Israel, putting, taking bets on who would be part of God's plan of salvation, she would be more of a rank outsider than the horse that won the Melbourne Cup this week. There were two people, two groups of people in Israel who were the most easily picked on, the most easily persecuted, and they were the widows and foreigners, well three, widows, foreigners and orphans. And whenever God sent the prophets, he said, how are you doing with looking after the widows, 
foreigners and orphans. And not only she was a widow, but she was a widow who was a foreigner, and not just from any country, but from the sworn enemies of the Jewish people, the Moabites. Which shows how bad things must have been in Israel for Naomi's family to actually leave and go to Moab, where Ruth married Naomi's son, who later died. So when she came back to Israel, she was a rank outsider. She just didn't count when it came to all the things that people saw were important. But God didn't look at the outside. God judges the heart and he knew she had some things in her character that were important. And from her line was to come, well, King David was to be her great grandson that she would probably never see in her lifetime. David who united the kingdoms of Israel and Judah and who was the ancestor that we know of our Lord Jesus himself came from that line. So God's plan of salvation, which is so important to you and me, involves this woman, this outsider who everyone else would have seen and just discounted, would have judged her by the judge the book by its cover. And in our gospel lesson, we hear of another widow, a woman whose name has never been known, never been passed down in the Bible. In fact, Jesus never actually had a conversation with her that we hear. He just saw her and spoke about her to his disciples. Yet in her, Jesus saw a heart that could gave what it could to God, a heart with self-giving love. And she has forever become the example of self-giving sacrifice and giving from the heart. I'd like to think she had the same sort of heart that Ruth had when she left her people. And for all she knew, her chance at another marriage and children and security to go to a place she didn't know out of love for her mother-in-law. A cursory glance at this widow in the story would have shown nothing special. And in fact, if you were part of the temple treasury, you would not, you'd think it's hardly worth her time to put in those coins. That's not going to help much. And she would be discounted. But the eyes of Jesus saw more, didn't they? It was not just a cursory glance, but Jesus saw her heart, saw one of his precious creations and saw the heart within So many things we are called not to judge by what they look like on the outside. As we know, I did a baptism here last week. Sorry, take that back. God did a baptism here last week. And we know that in the sacrament, God himself works. And a baptism doesn't look like much. If you want to join secret societies, there's all sorts of involved um, vows you have to go through and initiation ceremonies and all that sort of thing. Baptism's over in five minutes, a bit of water, on a baby who doesn't even want to be there, doesn't know what's going on. And on the outside, it doesn't look like much at all. But in the clear water of baptism, the Saviour of the world binds himself with each one of us with a self-giving love. We are baptised into his death, his death that shows just how great his self-giving love is for us. It doesn't look like a lot, but it does so much. We so often get things wrong when we judge by what things look like on the outside. And I want to share with you one which is kind of personal to me that really made me think. And you might be in a different place on your journey in this area and that's fine. About 20 years ago when my ministry started in my first little town I was in, there was a lot of talk at the time about um, asylum seekers and refugees. This was around the time of just after the Gulf War. And in my little town, there was a man who came from Iraq who had been in a detention center for 12 months. He joined our cricket team. He'd learned to leg spin while he was in a detention center. And he wanted to be one of the, one of the Aussies. And he said to me that you can't survive in there for 18 months without going crazy. I had fallen into very much the same view of most of the people I knew about these asylum seekers. They're breaking the rules, they're bending, they're going around, they're taking spots away from other people. They're criminal. Send them back. And then I had to think to myself, what would Jesus be if he came to Australia today? Would he be a travelling teacher? Would he be a businessman? You know what Jesus was? The first thing he was in his life was an illegal refugee as his family fled to Egypt to escape the persecution at the hands of Herod. 
Could I have this view of these people and then this view that says that this, these people are a child of God and could this view work with my faith? And for me, they really couldn't and I had to really struggle with that. And in getting to know some of these people personally, in the end, and it's not, I'm not saying this to my credit, it was my joy to be able to write him a letter to help him get his Australian residency. His family had almost been wiped out by Saddam Hussein's regime before he came to Australia to get away from that to survive. I had been looking at the outside and what I thought these people were doing, not looking at the inside and at the heart of this person, whether he knew God or not, as being a child of God and trying to see the image of God in him. And we see that Jesus didn't make that mistake. He did it time and time again. One of my favourite stories to go back to in the Gospels, Jesus turns while he's on the cross and looks at the thief beside him. And he could see in him more than just the criminal getting what he deserved. He could love the, in, the one inside, who however marred it was, was still made in the image of God. And Jesus could give him that sure and safe passage to heaven that we all want. Again, the one you would least expect from looking at him. Now, I talked about Ruth being the great-grandmother of King David. I love the story of the um, anointing of King David to be king by the prophet Samuel. You know the story from 1 Samuel? David wasn't an only child. He had a lot of brothers. And God said to Samuel, get them all together. I'm going to show you which one's going to be king. And the oldest one walked far past first. His name was Eliab. And we read from 1 Samuel. Samuel actually said, surely, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord, and this is the bit that got me, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord judges the heart. So how do we, who want to be more like our Lord Jesus, live out our discipleship calling to be more like him in this regard? It's by refusing to judge by what we see on the outside. As Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight. Our eyes can deceive us. We don't look at the outside or the actions or the way someone dresses but we strive to see them as God, their creator, sees them. As being made in his image. As Jesus, their redeemer, sees them as being worthy for him to give his life for. And while we're doing that, we can thank God that he sees us that way. He doesn't judge by our actions, our words, or even our thoughts. But by what he sees deep inside of us and when he looks inside the believer's heart what does he see i hope you can give me the answer it's the sunday school answer i always talk about what was it jesus remember if in doubt just go jesus that's the answer right what does god look at when he looks deep inside each of our hearts as believers he sees jesus he sees us covered with the righteousness of his son and made in his image Let's finish today with a prayer. God of salvation and redemption, help us to put aside judgment and to love with a love like yours that sees all people you have made in your image. Help us to live out your great commandment to love and to tell everyone of your amazing grace. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue with our next song, which is Hallelujah for the Cross.
And now as some of our offerings are brought forward, we pray our offering prayer. Faithful God, receive and bless these gifts which we bring as signs of our thankfulness. Help us as we seek not to be served, but to serve as Jesus did, humbly and wholeheartedly. Amen. And Isabella will lead us in the prayer of the church. The Lord our God is merciful and generous. When people lack the necessities of life, he hears their prayers, but those who make a show of themselves, he despises. So let us pray to the Lord of all and ask his blessing on those in need. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us life every day and for not holding back even your own dear son, but giving him up for us all. Forgive our sins of greed and idolatry. Build our trust in you so that we may be free from trusting in money. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for the faithful service of those from whom we learned the faith. Keep us from acting for outward show and build up our commitment to give our time, talents, and treasures generously to the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the offerings your people make for the work of your kingdom. Build up the church so that its administrators use your resources wisely. To this end, guide the work of all who serve in our national and district church offices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send out your saving word, dear Lord, so that all may hear and believe. Build us up as a community of your word so that your kingdom may come among us here and in the mission fields we support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Support those who struggle financially and those whose lives are miserable. Build up the compassion of those who have plenty so that those in need receive help and hope. Protect us from natural disaster, and today we pray especially for those members of our church family whose land and homes are threatened by the many bushfires in our area. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant good health and healing according to your good and gracious will to those who are unwell in our community and to those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Today especially we pray for Max Schiltz and his family after the sudden passing of his son Peter during the past week. Be with them all, draw them closer together in their grief and comfort them with the peace that only you can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, Help us not to use our faith to gain recognition for ourselves, but to trust you with full assurance by placing our whole self before you for your glory and your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He deserves our thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good, Lord God, Holy Father, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we adore and praise your glorious name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. And we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. 
I'll ask our communion service and pastoral assistants to come forward. We'll commune in our uh, usual manner with individual cups. There are gluten-free wafers available. Uh, we come up the outside aisles, moving to the centre. Um, I don't think there's many other announcements we need to make. Uh, there's Kids Zone today. Is there Kids Zone today? Oh, there she is. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, there's Kids Zone today. So those young people who are here come with their families, um, pass communion, and then uh, join in the narthex to go. Uh, and there's also, as usual, some songs will be sung during Holy Communion. You're invited to join in. So come and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ with this bread and wine.
Please stand for our dismissal and thanks. Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life eternal. Go in peace. Amen. And we pray together. Heavenly Father, you gave your Son to die and raised him to give us eternal life. Grant that we who have received his body and blood may live in him and serve you as your children. Amen. Now go into this week secure in the everlasting love of God, renewed by the sacrificial love of Jesus, empowered by the active love of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. <laughs>